Hey, it's really a special privilege for me today to be able to introduce both of our speakers. <laughs> Director Angel, especially because last time I introduced him several years ago here in the Cajun Dome and we had the, the big rally for economic survival. And we had 12,000 people in that room when I introduced him there. And I'm very pleased to be able to introduce, introduce our speaker, second speaker, Ryan Malone, because Ryan is with BP. BP is one of my favorite companies, and a company that I've worked very closely with in Baton Rouge when we're fighting all the different battles, y'all, that we fight. And they are a big participant in helping us accomplish our goal. So, introducing Scott, I'm, I'm not sure that I really need to tell you about Scott Angel, but I'm going to read what he has here, because it says a lot nicer things than I probably would have said. You've got to mess with Scott a little bit, it's so much fun. Anyway, Scott is responsible for ensuring oil and gas operations on the U.S. Outer Continental Shelf are conducted safely in an environmental responsible manner to secure reliable, efficient energy production for America's future. He joined the Bureau on May 24, 2017, following more than 30 years in reforming agencies and organizations in both the public and private sectors. Most recently, he served as Commissioner District 2, Louisiana Public Service Commission, an elected position he held from 2013 to 2017. In 2004, he was appointed Secretary of the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources in a position he held until 2012 under both Kathleen Blanco and Bobby Jindal's gubernatorial administration. But anyway, y'all, <clears throat> I cannot tell you the great work that he has done and he's got lots of other things here that I could read you, but I have to say this. I've worked very closely with Scott over the years on many different issues and involving our industry, and he's a big supporter of ours and a friend of Louisiana oil and gas industry. So please help me give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Don. That was great. And I certainly uh, want to congratulate you for being Laco Louis. Uh, what a strong masculine name that is. And uh, certainly deserving. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the tremendous efforts that you have led uh, as being part of the Energy Conversation of America. It's good to be here on the front lines in this zip code. Uh, certainly want to recognize uh, a few other folks. Uh, Randall Luthi is here, former MMS director. Uh, where's Randall? Randall's on the stage. Randall, thank you so much for your service to America as a guy who uh, uh, sat in the chair that I, I now sit in and did a great job uh, leading America through some innovative, tough times. Uh, so, uh, Randall, thank you so much. Uh, Randall is now the executive director, chairman, president uh, of NOIA and doing a good job as uh, being a partner with us. So, again, uh, good to be here. On the front lines, good to spend part of my day with folks who share my passion for a strong domestic oil and gas industry, a strong and safe domestic oil and gas industry. Uh, I want to congratulate LACO for continuing to be, again, part of that energy conversation in America. When you stop and think about it, it's been uh, some 62 years meeting biannually. I suspect we have third generation people in the audience whose uh, fathers and grandfathers uh, or grandmothers uh, or grandmothers perhaps participated in some of the early Alaco shows. I think that shows the strength of Acadiana, the joy of life, the joie de vivre, being able to kind of grind through some of the tough times, whether it's hurricanes or it's environmental disasters or it's droughts or, or economic commodity price issues. Uh, certainly uh, this spot in the zip code continues to strive forward to try to come up with solutions rather than crying over uh, commodity prices. And I realize uh, there's a lot to cry about, but I again compliment you on uh, on gathering and continuing to strive towards that excellence. I remember the very first time 
that I went to a LACO show. I was in the eighth and ninth grade. It was either Mr. A.J. Broussard or Mr. Jeff Landry, my industrial arts teachers, uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Guidry, I should say, who, uh, who brought me to Blackham Coliseum uh, for a LACO show. And I was impressed by all of that equipment. And little did I know uh, some 40 years later, so I would be uh, leading the agency uh, that is uh, relying on that equipment to help produce uh, energy for America. So again, uh, a lot of good uh, history. And again, to Don, congratulations on a well-deserved honor. Uh, and now that we have this chill in the air, everybody has perhaps had an opportunity to pull out their squirrel gun and maybe go out for, for a hunt, enjoy a football game as we turn our sights on to the Thanksgiving season where food and festivals and faith and family and fun are all in the area. Uh, it's, uh, again, good to be on the front lines in a zip code that has some of the most energy workers per capita than any other parish or county in America. Up until what happened in the Bakken, uh, I believe a particular county in North Dakota perhaps uh, eclipsed uh, Lafayette Parish. But up until that time, Lafayette Parish research shows had the most energy workers of any county or parish in America. And so we are absolutely on the front lines. And when I say, what do we mean about the front lines? I was on another front line last week or a couple weeks ago. I should say I was in Alaska, another significant front line for America. And what I mean about the front lines, I define the front lines as where the balance of the three E's happen. Those three E's to me are as we seek uh, at the economic engine of America, as we seek the energy needs of America, and we seek an environmental balance. If we put those three E's together, right, energy, economics, and environment, we are absolutely on one of the front lines of America here in Lafayette. This spot matters, so I want to thank you for what you do. Certainly, I want to thank you for the risk that you take, for the investment that you make, for the jobs that you create, for the taxes that you pay, and absolutely for the energy that you produce, you process, you refine, and you transport for the country. It's a big deal, and uh, I'm here to thank you for that. And I'm especially thankful that you do it all in a way that's mindful of both safety needs, personnel safety needs, and environmental sustainability. Because after all, if it's not sustainable, it won't be able to continue to happen. And nothing that's worth doing is not worth doing unless it's sustainable. And I know, you, I know this. I know you feel this way because I know that everyone in this room, everyone in this room enjoys an absolute perhaps day at the beach, an afternoon on the lake, maybe a walk in the park, a, a morning hunt, that clean air and clean water and green grass for all of us in this room is not a luxury. It's something that we, we want, that we need, that we expect to have, and we work towards it. I refuse to believe that people who work in a business that produces hydrocarbons for America to make it bolder and stronger. I refuse to believe that you people in this room don't care about the environment uh, in a way that's different from other groups in America. And I suspect that you uh, began to articulate your message and fight back and push back because, again, I know uh, many of you personally, and I know that uh, you uh, enjoy one of those activities uh, that I just described. In addition to the environment, I think it's clear to say that, it, that, that all of you know someone, either in your family, either you yourself, someone in your family, a friend, a relative, a member of your church, that works in our offshore industry. And that you personally want them to return safely to their homes. And I think it's important that you articulate that message and be ready to respond when folks uh, across America question, is, question what it is that you do and what are your motives. Uh, because I certainly believe uh, that your motives of doing it in a safe way and doing it in an environmentally sustainable way uh, are, are consistent with what we want as a country. Again, great to see so many old friends get a chance to meet new ones as we talk about technology and processes and how we might get to a better day. I'll bring greetings to you from Secretary Ryan Zinke of the Department of Interior and the men and women of Bessie who are working hard every day uh, to get us to a better day and to try to find the energy to fuel America. And while I realize that many of you have an interest in areas outside of the outer, outer continental shelf, let me make it very clear that my comments today will revolve around my responsibilities, and that is the outer continental shelf. So what is the path forward? I think it starts with understanding where we came from. 
where we've been. So when we talk about the OCS, as I shared uh, at the logo meeting several weeks ago here in Lafayette, one in every six barrels of oil that's consumed or produced in America, one of every six barrels that's produced in America comes from the outer continental shelf. And 98% of that, so of the one in every six barrels, 98% of that comes from the Gulf of Mexico. And now, today, 82% of that comes from deep water. And that deep water number was only 50% about a decade and a half ago. So clearly, the industry continues to accelerate and innovate and, and reach out in areas to produce more for America. It's a big deal. The Gulf of Mexico is a big deal. And uh, they certainly know about the Gulf of Mexico, the Department of Interior. And I'm in every chance I can, I am certainly making sure that folks understand about the men and women of Louisiana and in the Gulf Coast in particular who are striving to make that production available. You also might be interested in knowing that in addition to the production, the significant production, a significant province for America, that outside of income taxes, so certainly income taxes is the largest source of revenue for the country. The single largest source of revenue to the federal treasury, you could imagine and would understand, is income taxes. The second largest source of revenue to the federal treasury is offshore royalties. $2 billion last year. So what happens in this zip code, what happens between Fouchon and Cameron and Abbeville and New Iberia and Morgan City and Homa and Delcom, and I know I'm forgetting some spots, uh, but what happens here not only helps to fuel America, but it helps to fund America. And it's important that you know that so when somebody asks you what you do for a living, you help tell them that I help produce energy to fuel America, but I also help provide revenue to help pay for things in America. It's a big deal. $2 billion is a lot of money. Again, second only to income taxes. So when we look at the last several years, no doubt deep water has been the glamorous spot, has been that spot that's attracted revenue. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. But let me also say that in my conversations with several of leaseholders of shallow water, that while the shallow water provinces are well picked over, many companies have expressed to me that they believe that the shallow waters of the Gulf of Mexico still retain world-class geology. It's a world-class basin struggling through some tough regulatory environments. And I say to that, help is on the way. Help us on the way. So one of the things that we want to do is help unlock the next wave of investment into the Gulf of Mexico. That's what we want to do. And we'll talk about energy dominance in, in, in a bit. But making sure that we have appropriate regulatory or an appropriate regulatory environment that is mindful of personnel safety requirements and mindful of environmental safeguards, but does not bring unnecessary regulatory burdens that serves to chase capital away. Because as Don Briggs taught me a long time ago, it all starts, everybody in here starts with somebody willing to invest a dollar in the drill bit. And when you have choices where you invest your dollars, and those places are in other parts of the globe, it makes it a little bit more difficult here. So part of our job, I believe, is to make certain that our regulatory environment is mindful of our personnel safety requirements, is mindful of our environmental safeguards, but at the same time does not bring a regulatory burden that chases capital to other parts of the globe. And so for me, it starts with recognizing that when you go to work for the government, you don't go from knowing something to everything overnight. How refreshing is that? That it's okay to have stakeholders and partners. The good thing about the word partner is that you can have a lot of them. So in my world, 
partners absolutely include state and local governments, tribes. It includes environmental NGOs. It includes elected officials. It includes the academic world. And absolutely, I'm here to say, it includes the regulated industry. Because there's a lot of talent in the regulated, regulated industry that I think can help us solve some of the issues. But somehow, some way, over the last several years, it's been cool to put the regulated industry on the other side and say, no, we can't have conversations with you all. So I'm telling you, we're moving from an era of isolation to an era of cooperation, and we're moving from an era of creating hardships to an era of creating partnerships. We, as a government, do not have, we don't have the talent. We don't hire that talent. We don't own the equipment, and we're not willing to risk the capital, right? That's what you do. And for you to accomplish your goals, you need us. And for us to accomplish our goals, because we can't develop those resources alone, we need you. And where I'm from, and where I suspect you from, people that need each other to accomplish mutual goals, you can call it a lot of different ways, but partners are kind of what we've kind of, I think, learned in the first grade, right? We get partnered up. Y'all two are going to work together. Y'all two stand in line together. We get partnered up. We accomplish things together. I'm okay with calling you partners, and that's some of the, the, the change that we're making in D.C. It doesn't mean that we see the world the same way all the time, but it also doesn't mean we see the world differently all the time. It doesn't mean the answer is always yes when you call, but it also means the answer is not automatically no when you call. Okay? Because the reality of it all is there's a lot of talent in this room. There's a lot of people that can help us, inform us on what solutions we might have to some of the problems. And, again, I'll talk about some of those in just a second. But... It's clear that I set uh, what I believe is uh, uh, a pattern, uh, a, 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 a culture that we are going to engage. So it's about engagement, engagement, engagement. So how, do, how, how are we getting there? Let me tell you what, what I've done thus far on engagement, recognizing that it's engagement, engagement, engagement. Okay? Um, I've already personally visited with 17 of the top 20 producers in the Gulf of Mexico. Those 17 producers represent about 90% of the production in the Gulf of Mexico. I've either been to their offices or I've met them at conferences and I've spoken to them. And yes, you can about imagine that I've spoken to the BPs and the Shells and the Chevrons at the top of the chain and the Exxons, but I've also spoken to the Stone Energies and the Taloses and the Energy 21s and the Fieldwoods because they're all important. Everybody's important in the chain, whether it's the deep water or it's the shallow water. I've made it my business to personally visit with 17 of those 20. I was going to visit with another one this, this, uh, earlier this week in Houston. That got canceled, uh, so we'll get those rescheduled. But I am going to visit with folks who have capital or want to spend capital in the Gulf of Mexico to find out why they're not investing capital. And again, I realize that commodity prices are one of the things that's driving it. None of us can fix commodity prices. So you know what? I leave to leave what I can't control. I leave on, a, on for somebody else to handle and we're working on how we might reduce lifting costs, right, to make the province more attractive without ever, ever, ever sacrificing safety. So in addition to that, not only go and visit with those companies, but certainly aware that there are other folks that we need to visit with. I visit with the Center of Offshore Safety, the Safe Lifting Conference, the United States Coast Guard, the American Petroleum Institute, the American Association of Blacks and Energy, the Gulf Coast Restoration Network, Audubon, Ocean Conservancy, Alaska Wilderness League, Earth Justice, the Northern Center, the Pew Charitable Trust, Defenders of Wildlife, Pacific Environment. We visit them with all state agencies, Native Alaskans, and other industry groups. Again, listening, listening, engaging. Perhaps there's a better answer. Just because you work for the government, you don't go from knowing something to everything overnight, and we don't have a monopoly on all the good ideas. But we have to be willing to listen and open our vests. It's not criminal to sit down with folks who know more than us and listen, we can reject it. We don't have to accept it. We can reject it, but we ought to listen. So again, I, I, I'm obviously making it abundantly clear that partnerships uh, are what it's about. I'm one of nine kids. I didn't have the luxury of growing up where you didn't work together and try to get to a better day. You had to wear the jersey. I wear the jersey for the United States of America. In order to be able to make America stronger and bolder, we need to have robust energy production. The only way we can do that is visit with the people who help make that happen. You should know that during these conversations, I'm making it very clear that while the president and the secretary have made it very, very clear that they want us to look at overburdensome uh, re regulations, that we are not, we are not to reduce safety and environmental safeguards just because. 
our responsibility is to make sure that we are looking at unnecessary burdens at the same time not making the place less safe or less environmentally safeguarded. So you have my commitment. We'll continue to work on that. Beyond engagement, beyond engagement, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the rules that we're working on, but in beyond engagement, Bessie is going to work towards submitting itself to opening its vest and making certain that we can get third-party verification or third-party cer certification. I want other groups looking at us to determine if we're good enough. I know we're good. I know we got good people who are working hard. We need to make sure we're good enough. Because at the end, the goal is energy dominance. And if for us to achieve energy dominance, we have to absolutely make sure that safety is absolutely obtained, part of our culture, it's who we are, it's what we do, it's what we all want. You need me to be a part of that conversation. And so we are seeking to get ourselves certified in that area. It continues with investigating, inquiring about our safe OCS program. Our safe OCS program, for all it was celebrated by the previous administration, a near-miss reporting place. So much like the aviation industry, you don't have to have an accident. Let's have a near-miss. If we have a near-miss reported, you don't have to have an accident to report, I should say. You have a near-miss, you have a chance to report it without the fear of the long arm of the government penalizing you. So we can learn from these near misses. A great idea. More interested in the celebration of announcing it than in the execution of it. I began to dig around that this particular week or last week, and I found that of 88, there's only 88 companies that drill wells, operate wells in all of the outer continental shelf. I think there's 1,500 that do it onshore in America. But there's only, there's only 88 operators on the outer continental shelf. And what I found out in our safe OCS program, again, highly highly touted as we're going to do this great job. What I inherited is a program that has 88 operators on the outer continental shelf, and they've been able to enroll three companies. We've earmarked $8 million of taxpayer money for that program, and we've been able, we, I've inherited a program that's enrolled three companies in Safefield OCS. That's 3.5% participation rate. We need to be more about execution than the press release. And so we're going to work around that and see what we might do to get companies who are willing, right, to participate in, in a safe OCS. And I'll get to some of the economics in a bit, but I want to make it very clear. We'll be looking at that FAA model. So after we engage, 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 we let people know that we want them to consider drilling wells in the Gulf of Mexico. After we bootstrap our safety and we get certification around ourselves and then and investigate some of these other programs that we have, the goal then clearly becomes about energy dominance. So let's stop for just a second and think about the opportunity that we have. It's a really significant opportunity. It's one that I don't think that we, we sometimes recognize. So just for a moment, everyone in this room inherited Energy dependence. We all come from a generation where energy dependence was where we were as a country. And the goal was let's get energy independent. Great goal. And for most of us, our adult lives, we've lived in a country called America that has been struggling with reaching this energy independence. Before us right now is the opportunity to absolutely be much bolder than energy independence. It's called energy dominance. You've heard the president and the secretary use that phrase that they've coined. And what does that mean? Well, I would suggest to you what I think it means, at least from my perspective, is that we could take a page out of the farmer's book. On the strength of our farmers in this country, we have fed the world. On the strength of our farmers in this country, we have achieved peace. On the strength of our farmers in this country, we have made friends all across the globe. On the strength of our farmers, we've avoided perhaps some military intervention in some spots of the globe. 
because our farmers research, they innovate, and they've produced incredible yields in a country so blessed with resources. If you stop and think about where we are, it starts to, it starts to line up pretty close to where we are in this industry through innovation, research, and high yields. And my hope is that rather than being a nation that settles on trying to get energy independent, and rather than being a nation that just settles on feeding the world, our opportunity is not only to feed the world, but to fuel the world. And it starts on the front lines, and it starts in a zip code like in Lafayette, Louisiana, where we have these conversations. It requires that we think we got to throw the crutches away, and we got to know that we can run. And hopefully policy will begin to show up in the nation's capital that will be reflective of these new opportunities. Because at the end, right, you're out here and you're grinding and you're doing what you do and you, you're like, well, well, we, we producing, but nobody is, we can't, get, we can't get a commodity price that makes sense. What I would suggest to you is that while demand, forecasted demand up to 2040 seem like a pretty flat and maybe some, some elevation demand, but not a whole bunch, there is opportunities for us to supplant other suppliers across the globe, what are we doing here? And so my, my hope and, and, and to you is that as we kind of go through this and we, you know, somebody say, well, people in the oil and gas industry are the victims of their own success. They found so much that the price, prices come down and that they, they can't do anything anymore. Well, I say, let's go fuel the world. Let's, let's let, let, let our generation go take over in the areas where, where others are supplying and be that, be, be that spot. And I think we can do that. And again, I think you'll see uh, conversations continue to happen. So what are we doing in, in today where, at Bessie regarding production or opportunities or investment in the Gulf of Mexico? President made it very clear. He's directed a student executive order to look at two substantial rules in the Gulf of Mexico. One of them the well control rule and one of them the production safety system rule. So you can bet we have teams that are looking at that and looking at opportunities that they might uh, revisit those rules and for potential changes uh, with one direction. Go get rid of unnecessary regulatory burdens that are chasing capital out of the country. You can't achieve energy dominance if you have unnecessary regulatory burdens. So uh, you can bet that that is, uh, is happening right now at Bessie, and I would suspect that you'll be hearing uh, some news around the teams that we formed and what we are doing to, to get to a better day. Recognize that that absolutely... You know, I was talking to, to, to Ryan, and you got a rock star that's going to follow me, Ryan Malone with BP. You know, BP has a company with, with international uh, wingspans, right? They don't, they, they, they like the Gulf of Mexico, and you hear them say that. But they don't need to be in the Gulf of Mexico. They got other choices. And we were in a room, we were in a room earlier, and he was like, you know, we, we, we got other spots on the map. And he was talking about, you know, some other places that he got investment. And one of the places that he mentioned was Angola. And we were with a bunch of young professionals, and they thought that was a state prison over there on the Mississippi River. But, 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 but anyway, they got, they, got, they, got, they, got, they got areas that they can spend their money. And again, where it's Russia or it's Venezuela or it's Brazil or it's Canada, we're not the only game in town. And we need to recognize that we're not the only game in town. We need to offer a regulatory regime that, 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 that tries to attract capital. So, so we are doing that. You, we'll be taking a look. Uh, I think uh, BOEM, our sister agency, has... Uh, has, has, is working on announcing uh, serious lease sales uh, in all areas of the OCS, so they're working on that. Again, access is very important. Access to resource, very important. We are working with Bohm right now. Bohm and Bessie are working very closely together on some decommissioning sanity, right? So in 2016, there was some decommissioning uh, policy that was released that shocked the markets and cut off much of your capital. Uh, that is now being viewed as a... Uh, that was an awkwardly written policy that did no good, that didn't recognize the value of the proven reserves in the ground to offset some of the liabilities. Much of that conversation is, is ongoing now, and I'm confident that the administration will get to a better spot to make sure that that is, again, not one more thing that cuts off capital. Because, again, as Don has taught me, everything begins with somebody wanting to invest in a drill bit. So, again, we work, we're, we're absolutely working on that. When it comes to the regulatory regime, when it comes to bedside manner, when it comes to working with folks, uh, you can bet this Bessie director um, 
understands the front lines. I'm going to continue to be in the front lines, whether it's here, whether it's Houston, whether it's Alaska. I'm going to California where we have an office uh, next month. I think I'll be in California early next month. So I'm going to continue to go to the front lines and bring a message that we're capable, we're ready, we understand safety, we understand environmental safeguards, and we're all about it. And hopefully we can attract some capital here uh, to, to get back to, to, to work, right? Because at the end of the day, why would we... Why would we allow the rest of the world to have an advantage over us when we have the rule of law, we have democracy, we have courts, we have a brand that's unbelievable. And Don is picking up his paper. He's getting nervous that I'm talking too long, but, but, but that's okay. So, again, uh, let me say that the president and the secretary have made it very clear for us to find those things that are getting in the way. Don't reduce safety. Don't reduce environmental safeguards get rid of the unnecessary things, encourage people to go back to work. And my cell number is, if anybody wants to give me a call to talk about it, my cell number is 571-585-3730. 571-585-3730. I'd rather you call me. Everything you text to me is a public record, so be careful. Uh, <laughs> my email address, my email, ad my email address is Scott dot angel at bessie.gov to the degree that you want to talk about it again everything that you sent to me in the email is a public record as so it should uh so uh if you want to talk about lsu football games or the saints or ul or something else uh just call me the, they, we don't this is this is a business uh opportunity for you to engage with me on what you believe uh we ought to be about again i'm very very excited about some opportunities uh, to be here. I do see uh, Jim uh, J Watson here. Uh, good to see you, my friend. Former uh, Bessie director, good friend, did a great job, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to learning from you as well and some of the things. I know we've had the chance to visit, and you've been very gracious with your time. Sorry I didn't recognize you earlier. Uh, I scanned over here, I scanned over there, and I came back, and I caught a familiar face. So again, thank you all very much. We're working hard, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And uh, as goes Acadiana, so goes Louisiana. Thank you all very much. Our next speaker, you know, he's, he's part of an organization that does take their money and make it happen. And that's what's so important to all of us, which God was talking about. Brian Malone, <clears throat> when he's here in South Louisiana, to him it's almost like coming home because he spent so much of his career down here in the Gulf Coast. Brian is a projects manager, project general manager for Gulf of Mexico for BP, and is responsible for BP's development portfolio within the region. Brian joined BP in 2002 and has held a number of posts in both operations and projects. Brian's career with BP began as an operations engineer in Onshore USA then led to a number of project engineering and management note roles. Brian worked on the Mardi Gras transportation system deep water pipeline project as a construction engineer and on the Atlantis and Thunder Horse projects in various subsea and project management roles. Brian was the project manager for the Mad Dog Phase 2 floating system scope and held the position of Director of Global Subsea Systems, responsible for delivering all of BP's subsea systems designs and equipment globally. Brian was Executive Assistant to the COO Global Projects, where he helped in the creation of BP's Global Projects organization. Brian has a mechanical engineering degree with a minor in mathematics from, the, from Baylor University. Ryan, we're so very happy to have you here with us and back home in your territory that you're so used to. Y'all help me welcome him and give him a warm welcome. Thank you.
Thanks a lot for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. First, I want to acknowledge how important uh, that this conference is. I think that its history and rich tradition really is what this industry is all about. Um, and I know firsthand uh, by agreeing to, to come here and be a part of it, just how much work and how many people uh, are involved in, in making this conference what it is today and what it's been for so long. I'd like to acknowledge Director Angel. Through his leadership, Bessie is becoming more responsive and effective. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate that. I also want to say a word of thanks to Ladco Louie himself, Don Briggs. Don, on behalf of BP, I want to thank you for your uncompromising support to the company and to the industry. Your designation and distinction is well deserved. Appreciate that. Thank you. Today, I want to engage with you uh, in a conversation focused on deep water. I want to talk uh, primarily about five things. The first, safety. The second, what happened to our industry and to our business model in 2014. Third, the response. What have we done so far to date? What do we have left to do? Fourth, the future. What does the future look like for deep water and specifically here in the Gulf of Mexico? And then fifth, why I've got a tremendous amount of confidence in that future in the Gulf of Mexico and specifically focused on deep water. Before I get into the, to the deep water portion of my talk though, I'd like to start with a safety moment, our number one job. Last week, we all lost a member of our industry to a facility explosion that occurred uh, near Lake Pontchartrain. His name is Tim Morrison. Tim lived in Katy, Texas, and was a father, a husband, and a friend of many. He was my friend. I'm not immediate family to Tim, and I can't begin to fathom the hurt and loss that his loved ones are experiencing right now, but I do miss him already. Tim was my son's football coach, and I can still hear his energetic coaching wisdom ringing in my ears. My son Jack learned a lot from him, and we're both gonna admit uh, his approach to working with kids and with his friends, which was a lot like his approach to life, with intensity, with caring, and by having a heck of a lot of fun. Tim attended our church from time to time, and our college football debates on Sunday mornings on the strengths and weaknesses of his alma mater, Texas Tech, and my alma mater, Baylor, often made us late to the pew. I'll miss those debates, and I'll miss Tim's big old smile as we ended those debates, the end of which were usually prompted by our incredibly patient wives. My son Jack and I are a couple of the many, many people whom Tim touched and impacted, and this tragic event has made me realize something really, really important. It's made me realize that people sometimes underestimate their impact and reach, and that you never really know what you have until it's gone. To me, that's at the root of safety in our industry. It's not the metrics, it's not the stats, but it's about the people. It's about making sure each person returns home, ready to change a diaper, coach a team, throw a ball, mow the back 40, care for an aging parent, or have spirited college football debates. That's job number one. It really is that simple. We'll miss you, Tim. Moving to the centerpiece of the conversation today, uh, and as I mentioned before, I really would like to tie everything back to the deep water business. The past few years has been like, unlike anything that our industry uh, has seen for probably all of our memories. We've seen the price of oil above $100, and we've seen it below 30. Many people believe that a $100 a barrel price point is a great one for the industry. But through reflection and in seeing what's going on, I'd argue just the opposite. That price point at $100 a barrel isn't a sustainable one. But then again, neither is $30 a barrel. We got to recognize that the price of oil for the long term is likely to be closer to $50 a barrel than it is going to be to $100. BP believes internally, and by talking to our experts worldwide, that the price will be lower for longer but it's not gonna be lower forever. And that's the way that we're managing our business. We've moved towards changing the business model 
in line with this near and midterm view. We continue to challenge the notion that you need a high commodity price to make a profit. So to continue uh, to operate and thrive as a deep water business, you must change the business model. That's what's occurred for BP and for many in the industry. And that's what's going to continue to occur in the deep water business. We believe that we can make a profit at a sub $40 price on most deep water projects. And before I discuss the how in the Gulf of Mexico, let me talk just a little bit about the what, as in what just happened. After a decade of new players entering the deep water Gulf of Mexico, several companies have now made the decision to exit. You'll recognize the names like ConocoPhillips, Marathon, Maersk, Freeport McMoran. Around 50% of the available supply vessel fleet has been idled in the Gulf of Mexico. The helicopter fleet has been reduced by more than 100 airframes. Seismic activity fell from an average of 50 survey starts per year to now just 11. Consolidations and alliances in the services industry has exploded. You'll recognize a lot of these. Technip and FMC, Schlumberger and Cameron, Cameron and One Sub C, Siemens and Drescher Rand, GE and Baker Hughes, Wood Group, and AMEC and Foster Wheeler. Bankruptcy filings for oil and gas sector suppliers increased significantly. We had 43 in 2015 and 51 in 2016. Globally, the services industry has lost an estimated 40,000 jobs, and operators have reduced staff by upwards of 90,000 personnel. Hiring new graduates from university and trade schools was dialed back from historic highs. Both Texas and Texas A&M reported recently an anemic 58% job growth from its 2016 class. Fabrication yards that once were filled and backlogged for years became ghost towns. Orders for new subsea trees fell from a peak of 500 in 2013 to just over 100 today. And familiar to y'all, places like Homa, Lafayette, Thibodeau here in Louisiana have e experienced a, an increase in unemployment with the rate almost doubling. Uh, in recent years. These unprecedented reductions impacted many of you in this room, and your businesses don't look the same today as what they once were, and neither does BPs. Like many of the majors, we are faced, we were faced with making reductions in our capital spend, and we did this so that we could map a sustainable business for the prolonged downturn in commodity prices. As I mentioned, we believe in lower for longer. Now onto the response. So what have the operators in the Gulf of Mexico and in the deep water do to respond to all of this? Our challenge to the new reality was a simple one in the short term. We needed to break even in a $40 per barrel world and continue to improve personal and process safety while not giving up on the long-term potential in our basin. And I'll get to that in my confidence in the future. Additionally, we've had to dramatically reset our overhead with a completely new mindset. So let me talk about what BP did. First and foremost, we spent a lot of time at the front line committing to our stand of safety, making sure that there was no real or perceived conflict between our team's safety and the need to generate cash. We forged a plan for positive free cash flow by 2017, and we're gonna hit that goal. We paused and refocused our exploration drilling program we terminated one long-term drill contract, we let two others expire, and we warm-stacked another rig. We reset our approach to logistics and halved our fleet of vessels and helicopters. We nearly halved our Gulf of Mexico staff since 2014, most of this coming from our onshore personnel. We work closely with our third-party suppliers to capture deflation and efficiencies, and we continued investment to boost operating efficiency in our producing wells and in our operating plants. We tripled our investment in well work to generate a lot more cash from the base, and we listen to our teams and our contractors working really hard to get back to industry standards where it made sense. We advanced the technologies that we felt would move the capital efficiency dial in a lower for longer environment, and that was the entire focus of our technology program. And finally, we worked with our partners, BHP and Chevron, 
to re-engineer, simplify, and sanction our Mad Dog Phase 2 platform to be competitive in a $40 a barrel world. And through all this and so much more, we've rebalanced the cost and revenue equation such that our Gulf of Mexico business free cash break even point is now less than $40 a barrel, roughly half of what it was in 2014. The break even point includes the roughly $2 billion annual reinvestment into our Gulf of Mexico business through capital. And during this three year period, we've seen our production increase 15% year on year. We've seen our production costs drop by over 35%. And we've seen our plant reliability across our fleet rise to an average of 95% up from 86%. And we feel there's still more room to run. We haven't done this alone. It requires operating discipline and a change of mindset with our employees, with our contractors, and with our stakeholders. And the story doesn't stop here. While we've stabilized the business for the moment, we're driving to be more competitive in what is clearly a return-driven business in a lower for longer environment. So another key question, and then I'll offer a perspective. What does the future hold for investing in the deep water Gulf of Mexico? And let's start with the reality for now. For the last five years, discoveries in the Miocene play, where most of today's production comes from, have gotten smaller and relatively fewer and farther between. Second, not all rocks are created equal. A disproportionate number of the discoveries that we're experiencing today are in tighter, deeper, hotter, and higher pressure formations. And third, by some estimates, we have currently imaged only 50% of the hydrocarbon accumulations that lie beneath the seabed. And this is due to our good old friend, the salt, which is very unique to the Gulf of Mexico. So we need to respond to this change in environment and the changing realities in the Gulf of Mexico's geology. The history of the Gulf of Mexico is full of such moments. The same history uh, also proves that we find solutions. Through innovation, technology, and people with grit, we've always been able to get it done. We've always begun to stabilize and grow our businesses and look to the future. In fact, a much needed step change is already underway. Many of you in this room are experiencing it. Through a combination of fit for purpose design, execution efficiency, and in some cases, reduced rig rate contracts, we're seeing great results through our exploration programs. For example, the average cost of an exploration well rose to over $200 million per well over the past decade. Just recently, we've seen multiple will, uh, wells that have been drilled under $100 million with quite a few at $50 million and under. That's not just incredible business, that's completely transformational for what the future of the Gulf of Mexico looks like. I believe the economics for deep water developments make as much sense today as they did back in 2001 when the price of oil was hovering at about $20 per barrel. And this is about the same time frame in 2001 when we were making really material discoveries like our initial Mad Dog field and our Thunder Horse field. Today our cash margins in the Gulf are better than they were when the price of oil was $80 a barrel. This is because the costs have come down and continue to decrease, and we've really exerted efficiencies in execution uh, and operations. And if you ask me today to describe what a competitive deep water business would look like, I would tell you that you need the following. First, you need a team that values safe, reliable, and compliant operations. But not just that, you have to be incredibly systematic in your approach. You also need a portfolio of material assets generating sufficient operating cash to reinvest in growth opportunities. And you need to do this in and around your existing hubs. You also need a blend of company operated and non-operated assets. One, so that you can learn. Two, so that you can spread the risk. You need a deep set of quality options that can be brought online for less than $15 a barrel. You need field lifting costs in the range of three to $5 per barrel and you need your overhead to be equal or less than these lifting costs. You need operating efficiencies in the mid 80s, trending towards 90, and you need a lease position that provides renewal options for the midterm. Everything that I described to you can compete with tight onshore oil 
any day. And it actually looks a lot like the business that I'm part of today. So what else can make the difference? We believe that a real partnership with our regulators can be a complete game changer right now. Scott talked about that. We're engaged in active conversations, not just with Scott and others. Um, and it's no secret that the capital investment in the Gulf of Mexico is down. But we're not just competing internally, as Scott mentioned, uh, for, for these capital. We're also competing globally against projects worldwide. And that's why we're in conversations with regulators, competitors, trades, and others about what can be done. Some of the things that we believe that are needed today are going to sound really familiar to a lot of people in this room. Reduce the deep water royalty rate to 12.5%. This would align with what we're seeing onshore and on the shelf. Provide flexibility on rates for existing leases. Many of these leases were acquired at the 18.75% uh, royalty rate, and they're just not economic to produce in a $50 a barrel world today. We believe it'd be helpful to institute a 10-year lease period on all new leases, particularly where new infrastructure is required. Most new projects, particularly those in the Western Gulf, just require this type of lead time. And then it would be helpful to provide flexibility on suspensions, which would allow companies to shoot needed seismic and manage technology improvements without having to drill expensive wells just to hold the lease. Many of the suggestions were undertaken in the late 80s and the early 90s and led to world-class discoveries like what I mentioned in Thunder Horse and uh, Mad Dog. So I've talked about the fundamentals of a strong business, a little bit about the future potential, and I want to finish by talking about what gives me a tremendous amount of confidence in that future in the Gulf of Mexico. It comes from a firsthand account by me on the amazing things that our geoscientists, our engineers, and our data analysts are doing to drive down the cost of deep water supply, grow the resource base, and execute more efficiently. I want to share with you just one example, um, and it always staggers me on you never know when a tipping point in your technological advancements are going to lead to major breakthroughs. This is one of those. We've had decades of collaboration with the seismic industry, and that's resulted in multiple breakthroughs in imaging. It's yielded new exploration successes through uh, our existing leases and what was previously beyond uh, what we thought was possible. It's come especially in our ability to unlock our imaging uh, below the salt, which I said is uh, incredibly prevalent in the Gulf of Mexico. Earlier this year, BP announced another breakthrough in this space that's recently opened nearly 1 billion barrels of oil in place potential in and around our existing hubs. We've got what we call our new full waveform inversion code used in conjunction with ocean bottom node seismic data acquisition. And it's completely illuminated the way that we can now see in and underneath the salt. New development targets are popping out. And to put it more directly at our Atlantis field, this technique has allowed us to find a field within a field to the tune of 200 million barrels of oil in place that we can now target. Incredibly impressive. And it's a game changer. And that's what gives me a, a lot of confidence on the future. So as you're thinking about your first question, assuming we've got some time, I want to recap. Number one, the grit and determination required to la whether the last 36 months will be equally important in this lower for longer environment. We're in a return driven business and we need to embrace that mindset. Deep water investments and returns have been and will remain competitive for decades to come, and this basin remains incredibly strategic to our industry and to BP. The Gulf of Mexico remains vital and important hydrocarbon basin for the U.S., and it can easily compete with tight oil. While the basin is maturing, technology and the innovations that I've talked about will continue to unlock significant resource potential. And the full waveform inversion algorithm technology that I mentioned combined with OBN data is putting oil in the tank. BP will continue investing in acquisition and in this processing technology. And as we continue to innovate in the GOM, we must do it safe, safely and mindful that safety really is our number one job and our number one priority. It's a core value for us within BP. It's a core value for me and it's good for business and it's good for everybody in this room. 
So I want to thank you for your time. Even more, I want to thank you for what y'all do to advance our industry as an exciting place to work. As I've talked to many of you today, as I've seen uh, the booths that, that we've placed up uh, in and around this conference, um, it just gives me a tremendous amount of confidence uh, that the future uh, and the outward potential that we've got in the Gulf of Mexico is indeed really, really bright. So thank you.